yeah, so this is a, another rigidity talk. Um, you know, so there have been other ones, and they've given you a really great introduction. So I'll just uh, give you this slide, which it's a PDF, so the, this thing would normally, this quadrilateral would normally be moving. But, you know, I'm dealing with frameworks, so you want to think of them as like mechanical structures where, you know, you can't break it, you can't disconnect the bars, you can't stretch or bend them, and then you look at how it could move, and if all the motions that are left over are rigid body motions. It's rigid, and otherwise it's flexible, right? And so, so, you know, so the setup is that you end up with a graph, you have some edge lengths, and, and also an ambient dimension. And of course, the ambient dimension actually matters for whether the, the graph is rigid or flexible sometimes, right? So Shinichi touched on universal rigidity, but I'm not doing anything so fancy, so my rigidity is, is always local rigidity. So this means that I don't care if you could flip it out in a higher dimension and get to some other realization. So the motions that I'm interested in are really ones that would happen if you pulled on it, right? And so this is, I guess, now called local rigidity. And, um, you know, so this is a very good algebraic problem where more or less you've got these length equations and then you have some dimension of the solution space. And if that dimension is zero once you've modded out the trivial motions, it's rigid, otherwise it's flexible. You can, in fact, move it. And, you know, as Shinichi mentioned that because this setup is so nice that this dimension is really a well-defined thing, and it's well-defined generically. So if I look at actually all of the possible length assignments, right, so then, you know, for almost all of the possible length assignments um, for and any fixed graph, either all of the generic points will be rigid or they'll all be flexible, but you won't have generic points doing both. And if you don't like this word generic, you can just think that there's some bad measure zero set that is a proper algebraic subset of everything that can happen. So the combinatorial question is a question about which graphs are generically rigid. And this gives rise to this matroid structure. We've seen it before, but you know, you have here is the, the placement of the vertices, and there's some unknown velocities, and so this says that at the first order the edge lengths don't change. And so, you know, the rank of this system gives rise to a linear matroid. And of course, it's characterized in dimension two by the the famous or maybe prototypical theorem of Le Mans that we chase in other settings. So it says that if I have a graph and it has, say, n vertices and 2n minus 3 edges, and further, for all the subgraphs, if I've got n prime vertices and n prime edges, this inequality holds, then that's the same matroid. Right? So this is a combinatorial thing. You can check it in polynomial time using quite simple algorithms. And so, generically speaking, we understand quite a bit about rigidity of graphs in two dimensions. And that's really useful if you're doing other things, because these Lamont graphs have a lot of structure. So, because you know the combinatorial structure, you learn some, some stuff right away. So, for example, um, if I've got a 2D framework and it's generic, it's got a rigid substructure, I can tell that it's rigid by just sort of staring at it as an induced subgraph, and it will be one of these graphs again, right? Um, so every minimally dependent, right, every circuit in this matroid is actually rigid. Again, it just drops out of this count matroid. Um, every circuit is in the three core of the graph. Um, those of you who don't know, the three core is the maximal induced subgraph of minimum degree three. Um, and then we know how to generate all the Lamont graphs with local moves. So, so you get like a lot of structure out of the problem right away just by knowing this characterization. So if you're not proving characterizations, you can use them. But in dimension three, uh, the situation, as Shinichi has mentioned, Shinichi, I think, said there's no widely believed conjecture. Um, so it, it's kind of wide open. And I mean, to give you, even though there are a lot of classes known that Shinichi talked about, to give you kind of a flavor, like, it's not known if there's any constant amount of connectivity that implies rigidity, to my knowledge. So, so 
if I tell you that your graph is a million vertex connected, can you, tell, can you prove to me that it's rigid? Um, I don't know. I, I, so, so somebody laughed, but, but nonetheless, this is still, to my knowledge, actually an open problem, which, which, which is why I guess I'm calling it somewhat open. Okay. Right. And, and you could pick your favorite you know, your favorite property sort of expansion is even stronger than connectivity and still it's, it's open, right? So, so, you know, pick your favorite extremal property that is not, has a square root that is d plus one connected um, and, and probably nobody knows. Um, so, so even though this is, is kind of, a, there's an easy randomized algorithm that will do it for you if you're looking for combinatorial structure in, in 3D sort of, we, the general problem is pretty open. And so, so in this talk, I'm not going to try to do anything even close to that interesting and hard. Um, I'm going to ask about what, if, what, what happens when it's GNP, right? When this is a random graph where I put in every edge with probability p independently. And so I'm just going to be interested in questions like, well, if I want it to be rigid, how big does p need to be as a function of n? Um, if I think about increasing p or throwing in the edges one at a time, how does rigidity evolve? This is uh, things that I'm going to look at. And, and along the way, sort of, when, once we move to higher dimensions, I'll leave this combinatorial setting a little bit, but some things that are connected to other parts of, of optimization and geometry. So maybe first, I said higher dimensions, but we could ask what happens in d equals 2. In d equals 2, the, the world knows quite a bit. Um, so the question is somewhat old. I guess it seems to go back to Thorpe in 1983 in statistical physics. Um, where he asks sort of, well, what happens? What are the rigid substructures as a function of P? And we know. Um, so this messy picture is meant to be indicative of what happens. So up here, this is a graph and the edges, the geometry of the graph is not interesting, but it's not connected. Um, the edges are color coded, which you probably can't see, but they're mostly gray and a few are blue. And the color coding of gray is that the gray ones are the largest rigid substructure containing that edge is that edge itself. The blue ones are the largest rigid <laughs> substructure containing that edge is a triangle. Um, and so what happened was that I added, so this was a sparse GNP, so P was C over N for a constant, I'll tell you in a minute. And then I added one more edge to it, and now I got a new color of edges, and that was pink. And now the pink things form one large rigid subgraph, actually. So. And so, so this is, um, you put it into your computer, you see this, uh, that's actually true. So there's a, a kind of a sharp threshold at this constant C2 over N. And, and C2 actually has some meaning. Uh, so it is the threshold at which the three core stops being so-called two orientable. So orientations play a little bit of a role here. And what that means is that if P is less than C2 over N, then with high probability, you can orient the graph so that each vertex gets out degree at most two. Um, and that was proved by uh, Fernholtz and Ramachandran and also Kane, Sanders, and Vermald, although I have only actually seen this one in its complete version, the one that I understand. Um, and, and so, and so, um, so, you know, so Shiva, Kasavaswanath, and Chris Moore and I a few years ago proved that, in fact, when you go above C2, the three core becomes rigid with high probability, and then the rigid component builds on top of that. We conjectured an exact structure and size, but couldn't prove it. Um, but then, like, some smarter people came along, and they used similar ideas, but, but much better, uh, sort of stronger tools about controlling the orientability process, and they give um, exact sort of limit theorems for the size of this rigid component. So, so we understand really well how it evolves. So um, at first, there's nothing. And then eventually a big rigid component comes into this GNP and afterwards it will just grow smoothly until the whole thing gets swallowed up. So maybe just a quick idea of how this works. So um, this is not precisely how you prove it, but it is the guiding intuition that leads you to try and prove it this way, is that more or less if you inspect their argument, they are, if you're in the rigidity community, eating back the core of this graph using what are essentially these Henneberg moves that preserve rigidity and independence. And so their argument is roughly that with high probability, you can eat it down to something that's, that's really floppy using these reverse Henneberg moves. And so it's definitely so not got any rigid components. Um, you need to be a little more careful when you write down a proof so you do something else with, with sprinkling. But this is really what's going on. And then um, 
what my colleagues and I did is that we said, well, when you go above, you get orientations that have out degree at least two. And if you know that, and you know some properties of random graphs, and you know Lamont's theorem, you can get all of that to just go together to say that it, in fact, rigidifies, and then you got this structural thing. And so, so all the proofs in this part of the world rely upon having really good combinatorial structure. And so because of that, you can transfer the problem to another area with a, a nicely evolved theory of cores and orientability and, and get like what seems to be a pretty decent structural result. And so like I said, you know, what happens afterwards is that then the rigid component kind of grows nicely. So it's not there, it appears, and then it grows nicely. And around <coughs> the time that the minimum degree reaches two, the whole thing should rigidify. And, and anyway, that's already a, an older result of, uh, of Bill Jackson, who's here, and Brigidia Servatius and Herman Servatius. And one thing that's also interesting is that the argument didn't depend deeply on it being a rigidity matroid, so all the other count matroids, this 2, 0 sparsity, whatever, 2, 1 sparsity, so 2n minus 0, 2n minus 1, 2n minus 2, they all will have the same threshold, in fact. So they're part of, if you want to be so bold, there's some universality class, but it's a sort of specialized problem, so maybe the word is too strong. Um, and, okay, so, but when you move to d equals three, like the, the property breaks right away. So, so what's going on here? Like I, I mentioned some at time at the beginning that the circuits are all rigid in dimension two, and that matters because the two orientability threshold is itself a kind of obvious thing. It's where the three core hits average degree four. Right, and if you've got average degree four, you're not going to succeed, or above, you know, for two orientability, you just have too many edges, um, and so, so basically, you know, you you sort of bootstrap this whole process by you know that when the rigid component appears, like a, a dependence appears, a component appears, like this already just broke. So, so even getting started in dimension three doesn't work as well as you would hope, um, and so even though you could maybe get the other parts of the proof to work, the rigidity parts don't work. Or I, I shouldn't say that because maybe they do work. So I could not make the rigidity parts work. Uh, so maybe you can, uh, and in which case you'll be able to avoid some stuff. And so now at this point, the talk is going to swerve a little bit. So underlying rigidity is a matroid structure. So, but it's a, it's a sort of particularly nice kind of matroid. So here's a weird construction that, that may well be known um, in a preprint with Svi Rosen and, and Franz Kirai. We, uh, we wrote this down though. So what I'm going to say is we'll take some uh, irreducible algebraic variety and I want to make it complex. Uh, so it will make my life a little bit easier, but this is, in the rigidity case, not a huge deal. So, so in the rigidity case, as it turns out, it's fine to first take the closure of the set of distance matrices, which is anyway semi-algebraic, complexify it, and the dimensions don't change, so the matroid doesn't change. But maybe it's true always, maybe it's not. But this, so if you take your variety, you pick a basis, and, and this is actually really important. And then you can just define a function, which is the dimension, you know, the rank of a subset is, the dimension of the projection onto that subset. So like S is a subset of N, and then we have these basis vectors indexed by X. We project, we just say that the dimension is the rank, and this construction will give us a matroid. Okay, and I, we call it for some reason the basis matroid. Um, and then the rank of the whole matroid is just the dimension. Okay, so, so this is a, a sort of pretty general kind of statement. Um, so we could revisit the rigidity matroid and not just write down this first order equation. So instead we could look at the space of lengths. So, so basically I could take this variety X to be the, the set of the distance matrices. Now, really I don't want, you know, real distance matrices are the image of this rigidity map that people have showed you where you have a configuration of points and you map it to the distances between the pairs. That's not an algebraic set. It's a semi-algebraic set. It's also real. Um, but that's, you could just take the closure of it and you'll get a variety. And actually, this perspective goes back a little ways. I mean, so, so Ciprian Borgia had a, a preprint in 2002 
thing called Cayley Menger varieties and distance geometry, something like this, where he, he actually took this uh, perspective on things, and that's all that's really going on here. And, and so this is realizable as a kind of part of a low-rank matrix variety. So you just think of big, certain big matrices, and then you ask all the d plus 2 by d plus 2 minors to vanish, and that will actually give you the set that you care about, which is pretty nice. Um, and then here we're just projecting onto the entries of this matrix, which are the edge lines. Okay, so why did I bother to introduce? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so I'm saying that, I mean, these are the d-dimensional distance matrices, right? I mean, if it's not the d-dimensional ma distance matrices, then it just becomes everything, and then the actual distance matrices are the SDP cone isomorphic, right? Um, which you talked about, in fact. Uh, yeah, so, okay. So notice that the combinatorial part of rigidity, in a certain way, came from the fact that we dealt with coordinate projections. The geometry of this thing, with respect to the measurements, actually mattered, right? If we took sort of um, other ways of measuring the same object, so it's not an intrinsic property of this set of distance matrices. It's an extrinsic property that relates to the fact that we measure edge distances. And this will be relevant for us later because, um, you know, a kind of a folklore factor, I mean, it can more or less be found in any algebraic geometry book is that if you have an irreducible variety and you project it onto like a randomly chosen linear space of the right dimension, then you get finite fibers, which in this language just means that it would be locally rigid, right? So, so basically, but that's actually not what's going to happen here. So, so basically, so in general, you don't get a very exciting matroid. So the, the matroid matters that the basis vectors you pick and the set that you're projecting actually have some, th some structure together. Um, and that leads me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is the idea of coherence of a general variety. So if I have a smooth point, I can look at the projection operator onto the tangent space at that point, which may be affine. And I can define this quantity of coherence, which is just the max length of the projection of a basis vector over the basis vectors, you know, onto that tangent space. If the tangent space was linear, you can get rid of this part here. Um, and then you could take the inf over the smooth points. This gives you a number. Um, and this is not a concept that we invented. It's, it's a, it comes from compressed sensing. And um, in a paper about low rank matrix completion, Kandos and Recht used more or less this concept, but just specialized to their, their setting. You can think of this as like, it measures the infinitesimal randomness of sort of x with respect to the basis. Okay. So facts about this coherence quantity. In general, it is in between, well, the dimension over, over the dimension of the ambient space and 1. Um, but actually, this, is, this can be, re both ends can be realized by linear spaces. So, um, and this gets to kind of what it's supposed to measure. So the idea is that I'm going to take random coordinate projections later. And if I was trying to get points on a linear space, well, in general, if the space was, you know, a randomly chosen space, then I really should have to take enough to hit basically the right dimension. So this is one thing. So this is a kind of coupon collector argument. But more interesting is what it means to be really coherent. And that's that imagine that my x was the x-axis. Right. If I observe coordinates at random, well, I get no information about it unless I observe the first coordinate. Right. So it's so even though in general, if I had a, a random line, I could probably get back points on that line just by observing any coordinate because it sees all the basis vectors. But if my line was really going exactly in the direction of one of my basis vectors, right? My linear space is just points of the form x, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, I get a bunch of zeros. I learn nothing, right? And so, so in the worst case, um, so the idea is that in the worst case, if this coherence is very near 1, then you expect not to learn anything by randomly doing coordinate projections. And a useful fact is that always, 
if this coherence quantity is small, we can find generic points with a neighborhood around them where the coherence at these points is kind of smallish. And that's good enough because we can prove generic properties, again, like rigidity, only by just imagining that we work with points like that because there's a prototypical behavior over this space. Um, okay, and, and this leads us to kind of a theorem that we proved, and it's basically that <coughs> provided that, you know, so now we take one of these matroids, and there's going to be a constant C, which depends only on X, that if you now pick this set S of coordinates to observe uniformly at random with probability P, and P is big enough where P is coherence times the log of the ambient space, then you get a spanning set for the matroid with high probability. Okay, so that says that if you pick your probability with something depending on the geometry of the set that you looked at and also the ambient dimension, then you can recover things. So, so here's the application to rigidity. Um, so there's a constant C, and this constant C is actually global. So, so it's slightly better than I said before, because in rigidity we have um, lots of dimensions. But this constant C is global. Um, the dimension is not global, so it goes in there. And then we have 1 over n and times log n. OK, and if you have p this big, then your GNP is rigid in dimension d with high probability. Okay, so, so notice that this gets around the fact that we don't really know what these rigid graphs look like exactly, but nonetheless, many graphs appear to be rigid. Uh, and so the reduction to that is that it mostly involves estimating the coherence of this thing, which, um, and can we do much better? Well, no. Um, you could do, I mean, yes, we, you could do better, because um, I don't really, because we don't really know what C is, but C is not one. Right, but in principle, C can be taken to be one, and the D can be pulled off of the leading term. Right, so, so basically you could, if you were very bold, conjecture that a random graph becomes rigid precisely the moment when the minimum degree hits D. It is certainly not rigid before that. Right, because in dimension two, you can imagine if you have a degree one vertex, it just flaps around, so, so this is like, and, and so then you have this kind of coupon collector bound, so, so this, Theorem is decent, but not sharp. Okay, um, so what was the idea behind that? I, so um, the idea is essentially to do something totally different, sadly. So, so if you think about this, so the differential of this projection map, the rigidity matrix, is a matrix-valued random variable with respect to S, and then you have a projection from the tangent space of the image and theta, and the main step is to lower bound the probability that this operator ends up being a contraction. Um, the key ingredient that lie, underlies this, it really is random matrix theory, so this Rudelson selection lemma. Um, and, and the proof method is also adapted from Kundas and Ref's work on matrix completion. So in the last, yeah, I have five minutes, perfect. So, so, so where did this idea even come from? And I mean, the answer is a problem in machine learning or data analysis. Um, so, so matrix completion is the problem where you get a partial matrix. So you assume you have some big M by N matrix. Um, you see some of the entries and you see where they are. This should look maybe a little familiar. And then you're asked to like actually fill out the matrix. Okay, so, so in rigidity, we say something is rigid if you can argue that there's a finite number of ways of filling it out. Right, except, and if you wanted to actually get back the positions from the lengths, that would be graph realization, which is the rigidity analog of, of actual matrix completion. And so, so, of course, you have to assume some rank constraint. Um, and that's actually really true for matrix completion. That's a little bit different than rigidity. There are not, for the general matrix completion problem, universal entries that force a low rank. Um, so, so basically, you should know something about the rank, so, or you should pick all right, so I'll say it in a little bit. So, so basically, it's related um, in the sense that whether there's a finite number of completions or one in the complex case is also a, a generic property, so you can study it combinatorially. Um, so the proof strategy here is actually adopted from 
work about analyzing a certain SDP re relaxation of matrix completion introduced by Kandas and Recht and or their analysis. And um, it is one of the, the paradigmatic results of the field. However, successive, the algorithm itself is actually not a generic property. So, so basically, so this is, so one of their steps is that they prove the finiteness, the sort of analog of rigidity. Um, but um, unlike in, say, this universal rigidity that Shinichi talked about, where it's also not a generic property, actually, but the, you know, so, so you have to assume something, and the thing that you assume is, in fact, that the real thing was incoherent, in a sense, somewhat like what I showed you. So there's some extra assumptions. Um, what did we learn about rigid graphs? Uh, I actually don't know. Um, what we learned is that there's a lot of rigid graphs. Uh, but the proof method didn't actually give us any insight, which is a little bit sad. Um, so on the other hand, ideas from another area like compressed sensing um, actually are useful at proving rigidity. It's something else. And, and maybe that's, I don't know, so maybe one reason why there's no widely believed conjecture is that if you're looking to make rigid graphs, you will very likely succeed in your task. Uh, and so, so negative examples may well be <laughs> hard to come by. Uh, and, and also, the methodology here is not going to, to work too well for other kinds of random graphs um, because it works for these linear spaces as well. Um, it, it, you won't be able to get the evolution or other things without specializing it. So, and really, so in higher dimensions, we don't know what happens in between the time a rigid component appears or when a rigid component appears and the whole thing rigidifies. So, um, and so the, the questions are really like de-randomizing this would be to me actually really interesting. So, so state some, some quasi-random thing for which you can argue the graph should be rigid. Right, so, so even if a million connectivity is difficult, um, a million connectivity plus some amount of expansion, or pick your favorite, you know, high triangle density relative to the number of edges and a connectivity hypothesis, I don't know. Um, and, and, but really, you know, find some notion that's more combinatorial that you can use to pull out structure, or get some insight into to what's really going on. Um, from these analytic approaches, I, I think would be would be really interesting, at least to rigidity people, because it might, you know. So so now we can produce like even more rigid graphs than we knew before. So there were lots of classes before, but now there's like a really huge class that's sort of full measure, and um, but you know, but pulling out the structure is is probably the the rigidity wise at least really interesting question. Um, so and with that, uh, I think. Um, of time, so. so thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. If you want. Yeah. Uh, you said that your uh, you, you might conjecture that a random graph becomes rigid in R and A as soon as it has minimum degree A. It's I mean I don't know that I would conjecture it. Maybe a very bold person. What? Oh, it could be true, yeah. So what minimum degree does your result give? It gives some constant, which is at least D. Yes, you, you haven't determined it for some No, because I don't know the constant either. So, so, so the constant comes from sort of applying several concentration inequalities, which don't give totally. A f so since I don't know C, I don't know. I don't know the minimum degree either. Right, so, so, so that's the, the sad answer. So, so the, the degrees are Poisson random variables with mean around C times log n. Right, so then you get something, you get some stuff in the lower tail that are some constant with high probability, because there's a lot of them. But since I don't know C, I can't tell you <laughs> the minimum degree either. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I would sort of bet that's true, and I would bet that 
for the, for the reason that you could always just increase the constant a little bit. Right, so, so if, if indeed it did have, you know, degree three vertices in dimension three, it wouldn't be globally rigid. Right, uh, would also not be vertex redundantly rigid because you would take out a neighbor, right? But, but yeah, I mean, and I should mention actually, so this is a legitimate question. So in dimension two, um, I, I don't know, I want to have the picture. So in dimension two, the three core is also three connected. And I, I suspect that with a little bit more work, you could, you get this to be redundantly rigid. So, so and I think Bill pointed this out once. So, so you can, can probably get the three core actually to be globally rigid at the same time. Um, so I'd sort of, I, I would speculate for no good reason that in fact, when you're dealing with these kind of multiplicative, you know, these edge density thresholds, that the threshold for rigidity, global rigidity, and, and also other count matroids and, and sort of, is, is always the same number. Like, that would be my, that would be my sort of guess. And so, so a, a very brave person might conjecture it. I don't know if I'm that brave. Uh.